questions? All right. Good morning or afternoon, everyone, depending on where you're joining us from in the world. My name is Megan McGrath. I'm the educator Education Programs Manager at the Duke Lemur Center in North Carolina, and I am serving as the stateside host for this morning's talk. Um, and we are also joined by a couple of different people who are streaming in from Madagascar, so we appreciate your patience as we see whether things go well or not this morning. We will adjust accordingly. Um, and I think now I will turn it over to uh, James Herrera over in Madagascar at Cursa University. Thank you, Megan, and hi to everybody who's tuning in. We're really excited uh, to uh, begin the Malagasy Scientist Seminar Series, which is supported by the Duke Africa Initiative. We really appreciate the support that this uh, grant from the Duke Africa Initiative has given because we are now able to uh, create more collaboration between our colleagues in Madagascar Duke, and all around the world. So that I'm going to the director of the regional university in Saba, uh, Dr. Christoph Manzati Bay, and he'll tell us a little bit about where we are today. Okay, hello. Um, Christophe Mandarbe, uh, the director of CURSA uh, in Sava University. So I'm very happy to receive you at this presentation. And thank you very much for Duke Africa Initiative to support this program. Thank you. Hello everyone, hello again. Uh, my name is uh, uh, Marie Roland Swazafi. Um, I just finished my, my PhD presentation uh, and I am, I'm so excited to, <laughs> to, to meet you all and then uh, uh, I will do my best to to take the best contact between all of you and uh, and also with all the students from Cursa. So today our present uh, our presenter is uh, Dr. Uh, Professor Bouva Marine. She is a, a, a Malagasy scientist uh, from the University of Cape Town, and she is a, a, a tropical. Um, Biologist. Um, she did her PhD at the University of uh, Cape Town and her postdoc also in the same uh, university. And now she did, uh, she's doing her, her postdoc uh, with Vacha Association and Madagascar Biodiversity Conservation. So, uh, we are happy to, to hear you and uh, yeah, and also uh, she, uh, she already published five publications and uh, thank you for, uh, for sharing it with us. Okay. Okay, thank you for uh, inviting me to do this presentation today. So for today, um, I will be talking about uh, bryophytes, I'll be explaining what are bryophytes and um, a little bit of their life history, some morphology, morphological characteristics, how do you recognize bryophytes, and also why are they a good bioindicator of environmental changes. And then at the end of this presentation, I will be uh, telling you a little bit about the bryophyte of Madagascar. So for the um, past couple of years, I've been working on the bryophyte of Madagascar. Uh, studied in the north of Madagascar, and now I am expanding my research in uh, 
the whole mountains, high mount, highest mountains of Madagascar, but that would be a, a little conversation at the end of this talk. So I'm going to share my screen now. Can you just confirm with me that uh, you see my screen properly? Everything looks great, Luva. All right. <clears throat> so uh, to start off, I'm just gonna tell you what are bryophytes. So bryophytes are small plants, uh, chlorophyllous land plants, and they comprise of two uh, free morphologically but uh, phylogenetically distinct groups. There were uh, monophyletic mono, um, groups composed of leaverworts, mosses, and hornworts. And they are uh, the early land plants that ever uh, colonized the land after the algae. They are about 404 uh, and 500 million years old. Uh, so the, how you can distinguish bryophyte morphologically is that they are generally small very small uh, from a couple of micrometer to uh, the biggest is few centimeters, 20 centimeters for the biggest or one meter for the aquatic plants. So they like uh, vascular plants. Uh, they like vascular tissues. They don't have xylems or phloems. They also lack roots and they are attaching themselves to the substrate by using some sort of rhizoids. Also they are, um, mostly having a very fixed one fixed cell thick and um, they are also called poikiloidric meaning that they have uh, they can suspend their metabolisms in the absence of water and then resume their metabolism after when they receive some water from the environmental uh, um, from the environment some bryophytes are called ectohydrix, which means that they absorb and conduct water extremely externally, and they can absorb also the water from the entire surface. And also the connection of the water are done by capillarity. So some of them are also uh, endohydric, so they can conduct the water internally, and they can also have they have the ability of control the water status. Uh, to some extent that they can actually have a uh, water resistant particle so that will prevent the water from um, leaving their cells. All right, so as I said earlier, there are three groups of phylums in the bryophytes. Of them are the mosses, they're the most um, a popular group. They are characterized by very simple leaves and also sometimes a ramified branch. The leaves are inserted uh, in more than two ranks around the stems, and they have a multicellular rhizoids. Some of the characteristics are in the leaves. They have some of them have no leaves. Some has one leaf, one uh, sorry, one nerve. Some have no nerves. Some have multi nerves, and uh, some of the cells have this called uh, papillus, which is an ex, uh, some sort of um, um, something that's growing in the middle of the cells. And then uh, at the bottom, at the insertion of the leaves is a big cells, a differentiated cell that are called oseli, which is used by the leaves to attach themselves to the stem. And then one of the other uh, features of mosses are they have this uniform uh, and unique sporophytes. And in some of the cells, they have different uh, uh, multiple um, intracellular uh, chloroplasts. So there are two different uh, mosses, one of them which is distinguished by the incision of the sporophytes in the, in the gametophytes, so the acrocarpus plants which have the sporophyte at the uh, extreme end of the stem and they're not branching. And then the pleurocarpus or the mosses that are 
uh, that are branching and then the sporophyte are actually coming from the axis, the lateral branches of the, of the plants. And then we have the liver words group. Um, there are two groups in the liver words. The one is the thalloid plants, which is um, a mostly flat green talus. They don't have stems or leaves. And then we have the leafy liver words, which has a, a, a stem, distinguished stems and leaves. And the leaves are insert in uh, two rows on the stems and maximum three rows. And they also have, uh, sometimes they can be ramified. Some of them are thalloid as well. And uh, um, one of the most critical uh, um, features of the leaf uh, is the arrangement of the leaf because these are very useful for identifying the species. Okay, so um, bryophytes are uh, the second most successful plant in the world after the angiosperm in terms of species number the range distributions and also the habitat that they occupied. So you can find bryophyte, for example, um, in the polar region, but also they are very diversified in the tropics. You can find them in almost terrestrial habitats from the littoral zone to the mountain zones. And uh, for example, in the tropical forest, they have a very important biomass. In terms of species number, uh, it has been recorded that there are more than 20,000 species in the world and uh, in the tropics, more than 11,000 species has been described. So bryophytes are also very important group ecologically because a lot of organisms such as microinvertebrates or orchids or other insects are using them as uh, habitats. They also provide different important ecosystem services, such as uh, they contribute to water cycling. They also contribute to the carbon fixing or carbon and uh, nitrogen cycling. And in terms of economical value, um, some of the bryophytes, like the peat mosses, are used, for example, for uh, to create some of these. Um, um, green walls, and there's actually a huge exportation of sphagnum from Madagascar to go to Europe um, nowadays. Some bryophyte has um, some medical properties, uh, some important chemical compounds that are uh, active against certain cancer cell lines, and they can also be used for antibacterials or antimicrobial, and they have some antifungal activities as well. Now, I said earlier that bryophytes also have very diversified habitats. They occupied different habitats. They can on soil. They also grow on tree bark, um, on rocks. Actually, in the tropics, they are very diverse. The most diversified um, habitats are the epiphytes, those that are growing on tree barks. They also can grow on different leaves. Um, some bryophytes grow on top of any other, some other bryophytes without really harming the other uh, hosts. Some of them can grow on um, organic matters that are in the compositions. Some of them are growing on uh, decaying woods. And some insects are actually using them as well as a camouflage. So they grow on, on top of some um, insect. There are few, uh, very few bryophytes that grow in the water. And as I said before, those are one of the biggest um, bryophytes in terms of size. They can grow up to uh, one meter. So now if we, if we look at the life cycle, um, so the life cycle in bryophyte involves two distinct phases. The first one is the haploid phase, and uh, the second one is the diploid phase, which is the sporophyte phase. So um, there's some similarity with the, the algae um, 
cycles because they both the sex is expressed only in the the gametophyte phase, gametophytic phase. So for the bryophyte, the gametophytic phase can be bisexual or unisexual, meaning that the species can be uh, uh, monoicous or dioicous. So here we have an example of a species where the male gametophyte is in another individual and the female gametophyte is in, in, in the other one. So after the meiosis, there's a production of spore and the spore will develop into a protonima, which uh, from that uh, grow into, the protonima would go into the gametophyte, the female and the male, that will produce the archegonium and an anteridium. So the, um, the anteridium would produce the sperm by mitosis. And for that, uh, they, the, the, the sperm would need a film of water to reach the archegonium um, um, for, for, for the fertilization. And so that cycle is the dominant cycle for bryophytes. So that is one of the characteristic features, uh, unique features of bryophytes is that that gametophyte cycle is much, much longer than the, um, the, the diploidic cycle, which is the sporophyte uh, phases. In terms of um, mm -hmm. life strategies, uh, Bryophyte has also very different and very diversified type of uh, growth form. Uh, first one is dependent form. So those are mostly for epiphyte bryophytes and they occur especially in the tropical cloud forest. So those group of bryophytes, they have a long main stems with uh, short side branches. So in a humid mountain forest, for example, they provide the most surface area for interception of uh, the limited lights without sacrificing the moisture in uh, the humid climate. And they're also able to trap from mist and clouds the water that are necessary for the nutrients. But um, the, 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 the kind of exposure makes them very vulnerable, for example, for air pollution. And then we have some group also dendroids. So those are uh, like a tree-like form. So they are, they, they, they main stem with, uh, um, so they have the main stem with the top four branches on top. And uh, so the dendroid moss would seem because they only have the one stem in contact with the substrates and they are very exposed. They have a very exposed branch. And then we have the weft. So uh, those, are, those often have an ascending growth form in as a post dependent form. And they are exhibiting a well-defined annual branching. So you can actually check the, the age of the, 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 the plant by counting the branching. Um, they also hold a very considerable capillary water and uh, they, they grow very loosely. They are easy to move from the substrates. And uh, as I said earlier, each year there's a new layer of branches that are growing. And we have some of the mud species. They are very dense and they have a very horizontal form, uh, growth form. Um, and they are quite similar to the weft and the mud um, growth form. And then we have the turf. So those are like the, um, it is formed by one single uh, erect stem, which are usually parallel to each other and they often cover a very huge and massive areas. And then we have the final ones or the cushions, which has a very horizontal growth form. Um, and they have a, a stem that are more or less erect and they are very clustered to each other. And um, yeah, so it, those, those, those form are mostly growing on rock and it's very hard to detach them from their substrates. Now, so I've, I've sent you guys the, the, the difference between R and K selection in terms of life strategies for um, 
for plants. So for mosses, it's a little bit difficult to really define if they are or RK strategists as in, in seed plants, because as these two uh, strategies rely heavily on three characteristics of the plant cycle, the arrival and then the persistences and then the establishment and the growth to maturity in a developing community. So this is problematic for bryophytes because in the day of their life cycle, they can grow from a fragment into an adult or growing from a broken tissue uh, of a fragment into a protonima and then into a juvenile uh, individual, into an immature individual that can reproduce new individuals. So it's very difficult to, to, um, to look at the age, for example, of the plants or the, the where in the life cycle is the, the individuals at, uh, at the time when, where you are looking at them. So the first thing one must realize when trying to determine the uh, strategies for bryophytes is in context of comparison. So some bryophytes um, I'm sorry. In terms of comparison, as I said earlier, I said some of graphites can be having um, a mix of the character. It can be an R strategist at the same time as a K strategist. So most of them are in the both in a um, an, in the middle of the, the continuum in terms of strategy or, or in terms of strategies. Okay, so the R strategy is likely for bryophytes to start or um, short stayers. So they are adapted to disturb or rural habitats where it is necessary to arrive quickly in a place and mature before uh, habitat changes. So like uh, other R strategists, bryophytes uh, rely on the number of small spores to get into a new location. Uh, for example, we have the Finaria igrometrica. So usually those plants arrive directly after um, a fire uh, or uh, um, agriculture, uh, after an agriculture. Uh, and then, but they stay very quickly. And then after um, a short season, they will disappear. And then we have the ephemeral species, which are, um, they arrive directly when the rainy season starts and then right at the, at the end of the rainy season after reproducing, they will disappear. And then we also have the case strategist. So those are so those are very perennial species for bryophytes. And then um, so it's as I said earlier, it's very limited by our ability to determine the age of the individual in bryophytes. So for the case strategies, they are um, favoring a more stable um, environment. They have a longer um, lifespan and um, so here for example we have uh, an example of uh, uh, poly poly polytrichum, polytrichum uh, species they're very big species so it's very easy to know what's the age of the species by counting the um, the tops at the so it's it's easy to count by the, the number of splash cups along the stems is how you count the 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 how you determine the age of the plants. So those are perennial uh, species and they have a uh, uh, sexual reproduction that are very uh, that, that uh, are very limited and they also have a strictly uh, all strictly vegetative reproductions 
So they are in the other end of, um, of a continuum, which they can be both uh, reproducing by sexual reproduction or also by vegetative reproduction. And then we have, let's say, some of the perennial species. They are more competitive and they require more stable environment and where the habitats are more uh, predictable. This is an example of brachytechium, um, all brachytechium species. And then we have the species that are not putting all of the eggs in one bag. So this is an exam example of Cyropodon. So they would produce for uh, sexually, but also use fragment, um, uh, fragments and a sexual propagule during the season when energy is not needed for sexual reproduction or for reproductions. So they are keeping it more safe in terms of reproduction and use of energy. Yeah, and then finally, we have um, the, sh the short-lived species. So they avoid long period of severe stress and um, the habitat is more stable and um, it's not uh, so they have more uh, frequent uh, sporophytes and they started to reproduce after two or three years okay so what is all of that uh, type of life strategies telling us about how bryophyte can be a uh, bioindicator. So, um, so there is uh, for bryophyte this trade off between sexual reproduction and asexual reproduction, and also the trade off of producing branch or not producing branch in terms of saving energy. So as I said earlier, um, we have the sporophyte, the sporophytic phase of the cycle of the bryophyte, which grows on the gametophyte. So the sporophytes never branch. The reason is because it is very useless for uh, photosynthesis and the production of spore takes a lot of the plant's energy. So this is also why this, um, the phase of the cycle is shorter because as soon as they finish reprodu reproducing, the, the sporophyte is detached from the gametophyte. So that's why that phase is shorter. So as we could tell that for the goal for the plant is to reproduce and use less energy. And so um, one of the, the, the reason for saving energy is why graphites are short and, and, and not, not uh, in, in size. Um, so this would facilitate the of the sperm that needs to swim to the Ontaridia from the Archegonia. And also because they lack um, roots, they cannot access uh, like other plants, they cannot access the, the nutrients from the soil and there's no need of transferring energy from the roots into the leaves. So that's why the, the size is also small. And as I said, there's no, um, uh, uh, lignified uh, water conduction. So the nutrients are transferred from one cell to another one by capillarity. So as bryophytes, or they rely completely from the water that are available from the, the environment. So how do they deal um, with, with water challenge? So that is why they have so many different uh, growth form, which are mainly a uh, very low growth form, except for the pendant species that have a more ability to collect the water directly from the environment, since they are already high up on the trees. And also that's why they are more abundant in a more damp area, because it's, it's um, um, to, to have more access to water. Okay, so the reason why bryophyte is also a very good bioindicator is also because they only consist of 
each leaves are consisting of one uh, layer of cells, and the cells are charged negatively. As I said, there's no vascular tissue, so all the nutrients and waters travel freely from one cell to another cell um, in the whole body of the plants. And they are also they don't have no they don't have any roots, so everything is collected directly from the environment. Um, so they have this direct exchange with air and water, which allowing them to uptake most pollutants, for example, and they also have no um, internal conduction for pollutants. So one of the other thing is also that they are not, uh, they're very resistant to high concentration of pollutants. So they can also accumulate um, pollutants in uh, very quickly, for example, in an hour, but they, they contaminate very slowly, which is very useful if you wanted to trace the amount of pollutants in an, in an environment because they can keep those pollutants inside their cell for more than for months and more than a couple of weeks. Okay, so um, if if you want to know more about um, some of the study that has been done into uh, the on the bryophyte. Uh, as a bio indicators or used as a monitor for um, um, air or soil pollutions, you can read some of those papers. I could also send up this PDF if, if somebody needs them. Um, so now I'm going to talk a little bit about what are we doing in Madagascar and what are the current status of the bryophyte of Madagascar. So, um, the bryophyte of Madagascar is also very, uh, very diverse. Uh, in total, we reported that as of uh, December 2022, uh, 2021, we reported more than 1,200 species. And of those species, 28% um, are now uh, recorded as endemics. So this number of endemisms is still very, um, there's a lot of discussions around it because there are still a huge portion of Madagascar that hasn't been uh, inventoried yet or explored yet. So those endemisms are um, all data from uh, all the literatures that has been describing them as endemic. So we are not very sure of the number, exact number of endemic species in Madagascar yet. In terms of conservation, not all of the bryophyte in Madagascar have a conservation status yet. So of the uh, total number of species, only three has uh, or included in the red list. Only one is a true endemic of Madagascar. Um, and then we have the Symbizium madagascariensis is uh, also in danger, but it's not endemic of Madagascar, and then the other one is the Bryopteris gotisho dei, which is endangered in Madagascar, but has been um, extinct in Reunion Island. So we have not seen the species uh, since uh, the last record were 50 years ago. Um, so in terms of uh, bryophyte collections, they are a huge part of Madagascar, especially in the south, in the south and the west part of Madagascar that has not been explored yet. So we were looking at the all herbarium data that are available online. And most of the species collection has been done in the east part of Madagascar and the mountains, also the small islands. And the Recently, our collections are adding up a little bit that doesn't show in the map, but the mountains of Madagascar has been started to be explored recently. So where is the direction of uh, research is what are we doing now and what still needs to be done? So to to work on, to make an available data for everyone into having more access into the bryophyte of Madagascar. 
we are developing the um, continuing the catalog of plants in Madagascar and recently we've uh, added the information about bryophytes. So for those who are not familiar with the catalog of plants in Madagascar, it includes all the list of species that are recorded for Madagascar. And for each species, we they add the information about the locations and their barium data, and then taxonomic revisions, and then uh, conservation status for all the species in Madagascar. So this is now an ongoing work um, in collaboration with Missouri Botanical Garden and the Tsimbazas into completing the, the flora of Madagascar and making it available online. And then we are also now busy working on accelerating taxonomy for bryophytes. So the one of the main bottom line in studying bryophyte is that there are no keys for the species identification. So what we are doing now is that we are collecting um, image data bank, data bank for bryophytes. So we are taking picture of individual and all criteria uh, and leaves and collecting all the morphological traits that are measurable uh, so that we could create an automated identification uh, for bryophytes. So those are the different uh, morphological traits that we are measuring uh, in parallel with taking all the pictures of bryophytes. So the goal is to, to describe biodiversity faster, as well as um, having an available tools for everyone that are curious into working on bryophyte into the identification. And then one of the other um, project that we are setting up now is to use bryophyte as a, to measure air pollution and heavy metal in Madagascar. So the objective of this new project is to set up a long-term monitoring of air quality by uh, using moss around Tana, and also at some stage to um, provide new and a sustainable recommendation for policymaker and for the environmental uh, and for the um, government into how to better control air pollution in Madagascar. And um, the other uh, project that we are doing now is that we are exploring all of the high mountains of Madagascar. We're doing a biological exploration there. And uh, the reason why we have chosen to study the high mountains of Madagascar is that those are also one of the least uh, documented component of the biodiversity in Madagascar. Um, we have seen all of the books that has been publishing all different uh, groups of plants and animals from other mountains in Madagascar, but all of them are missing information about bryophytes. So that has motivated us to do a more thorough inventory and ecological study on the mountains in Madagascar. And it also turns out that uh, the tropical mountains in Madagascar host the high diversity of very high diversity of mosses. For example, in the Marujes National Park, just from the epiphyte community, we um, identified 265 species. And also, um, we don't, in the, in the tropics, we don't know, uh, there is a very lack of knowledge on the ecosystem services provided by bryophytes. So this also motivated us to study the, the bryophyte along elevational gradients and um, to, to, to look at what are the patterns and what are the, the drivers of species diversity and distribution along elevational gradients and to understand um, what are the effect of environmental changes on bryophyte and on biodiversity. And then finally, there's also a missing data on uh, Bryophyte in terms of conservation planning. So by doing the study, we'll be providing more and new recommendation that are uh, beginning to use bryophyte into uh, setting up new conservation status or new uh, prote pro protected areas.
Okay, so um, what what do we do on the mountains? Is that we um, the what I am mostly interested in studying bryophyte on the mountains is that we want to do first of all the floristical inventory of bryophyte, but also we wanted to. I am um, interested into uh, an looking at how the variation in environmental conditions and uh, uh, affect the community of bryophyte, the dynamic of the community at the local and regional scales. And so I also wanted to look at the um, functional diversity and phylogenetical diversity in bryophyte, and then to look at um, how uh, bryophyte traits or structures, how bryophyte traits are conserved phylogenetically, and how can you include that to understand and to measure uh, the impact of climate change in a bryophyte community. So those are the things that I'm mostly interested in. So what do we do is that we were collecting bryophyte along elevational gradients from the low uh, elevation of the mountains into the summit. We were looking at all the um, the, the microhabitats, the corticulus, the epiphyllus microhabitat, the terriculus, and the, I mean, the whole ground community. And also we were collecting um, temperature and relative humidity along this elevational gradient in able to, in, so that we would be able to measure what are the impact of temperature and relative humidity in the community, in the assemblage of community of bryophytes. So those would be used at some stage as a proxy to better understand how biodiversity respond to climate change or to any environmental changes. So we were doing our uh, field work in the north of Madagascar. Those are our sites inside the Tanana National Park. And we also have uh, a site in the Marujej National Park uh, in the south, more in the south at the end of the corridor of the Alas Nana in the Anduela National Park. And uh, the final site is in Nanjing National Park, which we will be sampling sometimes this year. So that is what I have to say for now. If, if you have any questions, I'm very happy to answer. Wonderful. Thank you, Luva. Um, do you want to stop sharing your screen so we can see you as you answer questions? Yes. And we do have a couple of questions already. All right, let me, there we go. Uh, so uh, one of our first questions is, what got you personally interested in studying bryophytes? <laughs> oh, so um, I did my first field work in 2009 with a group of bryologists. So it was just, um, it was very nice because they're very passionate people and then we were looking at, they were teaching me how to identify them, how to look at specific traits and then it was just very, very nice to look on the uh, hand lenses, on the different, like a small and cute characteristic of mosses. And also I was looking for something that uh, hasn't really been done yet uh, in Madagascar. So I was, I was doing my own research of which group has I think we lost you at the very end. You were saying that you were doing research on groups that hadn't been studied as much? Yes, yes, yeah. So it turns out Bryophyte were one of them. And yeah, so I met my supervisor and then we were discussing about what can be done with Bryophytes. There's so much to be done. There are a lot of species to be to, that all remain undescribed 
in terms of understanding the ecological um, property of bryophytes. There's so much to be done. So it's it's there's so much that 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 can be developed with bryophytes that have also got me very interested in studying them. Wonderful. And it looks like James has a question at Cursa in Madagascar. So I'll pass it over to him. Yeah, uh, we have a question because it's it was really interesting from the audience. And also your your study area was in, in the east part of, of Madagascar. And uh, regarding the climate change, we would like to ask, um, which species was the most dominant in the past species of, of bryophyte and, uh, and uh, now which species could be dominant now and, and also in the future? Also, in terms of species dominance, we do not have for Madagascar enough data to describe which one is the most dominant, which was more dominant in the future. As I say, we don't have enough uh, collections from all part of Madagascar, even from the east part of Madagascar. So I cannot tell you now which are the most dominant yet and what, which one is going to be more dominant in the future. Wonderful, and I have another question um, from our chat on YouTube, which is for the bryophytes that grow on barks and plants, is there specificity between the host plant and the bryophyte species? Not, not in my, in my knowledge. Interesting, so they could potentially have multiple host plants or multiple host mediums? I guess it all depends on where the bryophyte will decide to, to grow. It depends on the availability of the, of the um, light or water availability. So if it's in a op more open area, for example, there will be more there for the species that loves light. So there's no real correlation between how do they choose their the plants that they're going to be using the substrates yet. That's interesting. But it hasn't been proved yet. I haven't seen any, any data on that. It sounds like that's part of why you love studying them, right? Because a lot hasn't been proved yet. So, but the, 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 the one thing is that it's not, it's not, they're not harming the substrate. So that's why there are also lots of bryophyte that live on top of bryophyte without anyone being uh, not functional or not photosynthesizing. So for example, there are mosses there in a very small uh, um, specimens of maybe uh, 50 square centimeter, you can have, more than 20 species of bryophyte living together one on top of the others. So I guess the, the question is more about the availability of resources rather than preferences in, the, in terms of substrates. And when you're looking at a sample of these, these tiny things, is it hard to distinguish which different species you're looking at with just the morphology? How much do you look at morphology versus genetics when you're looking at species? Well, for now, we are looking more about the morphology, but we'll be adding more uh, genetics after to look for potential cryptic species as well. But for the morphology, uh, it's uh, you have to have the good eyes because they are really, really small, some of them, and some are just hidden on, um, behind one, somebody's leaves or something like that. So uh, morphologically, for most in legal words, it's very easy to distinguish them. It's just a matter of uh, you just need to get used to it. Okay, um, and then do you have a favorite species or group of bryophytes? Yeah, so I am more, I like to work in on liverworts more. They are smaller, but I'm more used to them. <laughs> Some people have preference for mosses because they're bigger. And uh, I think the size is also makes it easier to identify, but liverworts has this, um, um, it's easier for me to identify them because I think it's very easy to distinguish one genus to another one. Um, all the morphological criteria are uh, easy to, to measure. 
Um, and I have my one favorite, which is the Pleurosium, Pleurosia gigantea, which is a huge uh, species of liverwurst that occurs on Leon Mountains in the tropical mountains. It has Wonderful. a color. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so I think we have another question from Cursa. I can pass it back over to them. Yeah, uh, thank you. Uh, we would like to ask if it is possible that uh, one of our students uh, from Cursa could, could join you as a volunteer in, the, uh, in your field work in Andrinja uh, National Park. Yeah. Yes, we can speak yeah. okay. Honestly, that was one of my questions too, but it's a little harder to get to you. Um, so we also have another question and this person joined a little late. So you talked about this a little, but about the importance of bryophytes in the environment. Um, you mentioned them as bioindicators, but do they also play key roles in looking at things like air quality and um, keeping water and air quality good, or are they more indicators of things like water and air quality? So far, just uh, indicators. Um, yeah. Okay, great. It would be interesting to look at if they could be helped as cleaning the water or something like that, or helping in, you know, um, refreshing the air, but so far we will be just, um, they are mostly used to monitor, to measure uh, air quality and the quantity of heavy metals in the environment. Wonderful. And I'm personally curious, you mentioned in the beginning that there is a bryophyte that can reach one meter in size. Can you tell us more about that bryophyte? So there is a one aquatic mosses, I can't remember the name, but that is actually a uh, those are the big ones. Um, they, we don't have it in Madagascar. Uh, I'm, I'm not remembering the name of the genus, but I think it's one genus only that can reach that one meter. The biggest that we have, the tallest that we have in Madagascar is the one from the Polytricaceae, and it can reach up to 20 to 25 centimeters. And they grow on soil as well. And I guess by contrast, can you talk about like the tiniest ones you have in Madagascar? Well, what do you mean? <laughs> like the smallest bryophytes? Because some are obviously much smaller. So the smallest one is called the Microlegeniaes. By its name, it's a microscopic one. So the I think the length of the gametophyte goes to... Um, 10 micrometers and then it is large as a five micrometer it's very small and they are very abundant in the, in the rainforest we have i've now seen three species from my collections in the um, manduela national park wow. very beautiful very beautiful species if you can see it <laughs> yes if you can see it. <laughs> um so I have one more question and I'll give the chat a little more time on YouTube to see if there are more, but we talk a lot with like plants and animals about invasive species coming in and threatening the existing endemic species. And I'm wondering if invasive bryophytes are a thing in Madagascar and if you could talk a little more about that or if they're not. So there are some invasive species of bryophyte in Madagascar. I haven't seen much yet, but um, we have seen some in Reunion Island, for example, on the mountain. There's a species of hypnum. They are invasive, but it's not harmful so far. Uh, as I said, there is a more is a more of a facilitation within amongst bryophyte community rather than competition. So, so far, the the invasive species are not really um, harmful to the other species. Or maybe we don't have enough information to say that they might be harmful to the other species, to the native species yet. Um, from the, all of my collection in the national parks and in the for native forest, I haven't seen the invasive species yet. 
Okay, and speaking of the national parks, we just got a question if you could talk a little more about your time in uh, Marojeje National Park, studying the bryophytes and, and finding so much diversity um, and just a little more about your field work there. Yeah, so we, the first time I went to Marojeje was in 2009 and I was actually, it happens during one of the cyclone days that we were in the middle of the cyclone, we were in the forest when the cyclone hit the uh, hit hit Samba. Um, so we we collected during ten days from uh, the uh, four hundred fifty meter, and we went up to the summit. Um, it was the the team was composed of seven bryologists and one guy studying fern, and then. Uh, um, we've, uh, from that collection, we've fully identified all of the epiphyte species, as I said, we had about 265 species, and we've added from Maruzet 40 new species from Madagascar, um, not new for science, but only new for Madagascar. And then a uh, couple of years after I went back to Maruzet to install uh, data loggers to collect temperature and relative humidity. And then not so long ago, we went with a team of a biologists to do a more uh, floristical inventory of uh, uh, the mountains where I was collecting all the species that I found on the on the the the, the trails, the the trails from the bottom to the top of the mountain. Very nice forest. <laughs> Absolutely. And we have another question about whether pollutants are always bad for bryophyte growth or if they can ever impact it in a positive way. You hear sometimes of plants or other species adapting to pollutants and the chemicals they might produce. Yeah, so they are actually, so that's the other problem is that the, the pollutants are staying inside of the cells for a long period of time and then they will decontaminate themselves. But so far we haven't seen bryophytes that completely died or dried out from the pollutants because what the only thing that might cause the, 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 the for bryophyte to stop, um, to die is potentially the lack of water. So if there's no water, it would dry it out and then it will not function anymore. But as long as there are water, then it will still be alive. It will still be photosynthesizing, but then also it will be only just accumulating all of the pollutants until it decontaminated from all of that. Wonderful, thank you so much. So I, I think we will give it a few more moments because there's a bit of a delay for questions, but I think we've reached the end of our questions. That was a fascinating talk. Thank you so much for teaching us so much about such an underrepresented part of the biosphere of Madagascar. Um, and I think I will say thank you, Lua, for teaching me today. And I know that um, the folks over at Curso would also like to say something before we sign off. Thank you very much, Luva. We really enjoyed your talk. It was fascinating. I just want to point out we had um, about 200 students, staff, and faculty packing into the classroom here. The doors were bursting and people even just poking in uh, from outside because they were so interested. I saw a lot of um, interested looks and a lot of people taking notes. So I just confirmed with the director that this is actually the first um, virtual conference like this that they've had, and they're really excited to be able to host you. Thank you very much for your talk. And um, also, you know, I hope it's okay if uh, students want to follow up with you afterwards because there is quite a bit of interest. Uh, I also just want to mention the uh, next speakers. We've got quite a lineup for the rest of um, the spring and into the summer. So our next speaker will be on May 3rd with Dr. Sahenu Anjian Saralaza, which she will discuss about seed dispersal of baobabs. Uh, that's uh, there's six species of endemic trees called baobabs here in Madagascar. On May 4th, day after, we'll have uh, Dr. Miali Rosanna Zatu, who will talk about pollinator interactions with native and non native plants. Uh, on May 17th, we will have Dr. Zara Ranjia Manahutu, who will be discussing about astronomy as well as uh, her work in involving women in STEM in Madagascar. And lastly, on June 6th, we will have Dr. Sarubidi Rakutunariv, who is a specialist in environmental economics and conservation. 
So we're really looking forward to this lineup. Uh, thank you again to the Duke Africa Initiative. Thank you to the DLC for hosting. And once again, thank you very much, Lula, for this wonderful presentation. Pleasure. <laughs> All right, we will go ahead and sign off. Thank you so much, everyone.